Good evening, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen in the hope that you'll be able to see my slides. There we are. If the admin team can give me a quick thumbs up to make sure that you, you can see what I can see. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you. So thank you very much indeed for the very kind introduction. It's nice to see so many people joining the presentation and I hope it will be useful for you. So my name is Jackie Nevels. I'm a consultant nephrologist. I now work in Portsmouth. And I was trained as a nephrologist to focus on blood pressure, blood results, all the dialysis parameters, et cetera. But I very quickly learned that focusing on numbers doesn't often make patients feel any better. Skin problems are a big problem for people with kidney disease, and it's only one of the issues that patients with renal disease suffer from. But there's actually a lot we can do to manage the skin care. There we are. So this is just a quick overview of our talk this afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the skin and what it actually does by way of introduction. And then we'll move on to talk about the symptoms of dry skin <laughs> and itchy skin. There's a few pictures of rashes for, which may be important to some of you for some things to look out for. And then the main section of the talk is about skin cancer, which can be a big problem for some renal patients. And we'll talk about how you can protect yourself from the sun and do your best to prevent skin cancer in the future. And at the end, I'm happy to take any questions. So we'll start then by talking about the skin and what it actually does. And it has a huge number of functions. The skin is actually the largest body, the largest organ in the human body. And it acts as the body's first line of defense against a variety of insults. It prevents the body losing moisture and water and actually acts as the body's own UV protection from the, the harmful rays from the sun. The, the skin is a sensory organ and it allows you to obviously to feel touch, pressure, temperature, vibration, texture, lots of different sensations. The skin also provides a huge role in temperature regulation for the body. And you can see in this schematic here, the huge variety of blood vessels in the skin, which can constrict, which means when you go blue and cold, so the body can conserve heat. And these blood vessels can also dilate to allow the body to lose heat. The skin is also a huge part of the body's immune system and plays a big role in the production of vitamin D, which I'll talk more about in the sun care section. And as physicians, we can actually use the skin as a way of administering medication, as sometimes tablets are not appropriate. And examples include patches, for example, for pain relief and also for medication absorption like uh, hormone replacement therapy. And we mustn't forget that us humans actually use the skin as a social function some people are more attractive than others, for example. So it's really important to look after your skin. Let's talk first then about dry skin. Dry skin in patients with chronic kidney disease is called uremic cirrhosis, and it's really, really common. It can affect up to 85% of patients on hemodialysis and also a significant proportion of people with CKD. Why does it happen? Well, in renal failure, the skin's sweat glands and also sebaceous glands don't work very well and the skin can become dehydrated and start to look like this. Why is it a problem? Well, the skin can start to look flaky and also some patients are really upset by the appearance of their skin. Not only is the look um, not as good as we'd like it to be, the skin can feel really irritated and also itchy. And because the skin's barrier function is disrupted, there is possibly an increased risk of infection, such as cellulitis. So what can we do about it? Actually, keeping the skin moist can be somewhat of a challenge. And we advise patients to use an emollient or moisturizer twice a day, every day. It's often best to apply skin cream directly after your bath or a shower, as this can help moisture be trapped into the skin. It's important to pat your skin dry gently after a shower to avoid irritation before you apply your moisturizer. It's also really important to use enough. A 500 gram tub such as Balneum Plus, which I've illustrated here, should last just a fortnight. And patients often find don't use enough or apply often enough. And it is quite hard work to keep your skin moisturized, but it is worth the effort and it really does work with this method. So what are emollients that we use to soothe and hydrate the skin? Basically, we can subdivide them into three groups, lotions, creams, and ointments. 
And these are differentiated by the amount of water or lipid there are in each cream or lotion. Lotions have the most water content, which means that they're easiest to apply and are absorbed more easily. And there are many different varieties you can get in the supermarket or any chemist. A little bit thicker than lotions are creams, which are slightly less easy to apply, but are more effective than lotions. And they do take a little while longer to absorb. And examples include Bounty and Plus or Aveeno. Ointments have more lipid content, so actually they're quite tricky to apply, but they're very, very effective at hydrating your skin. They are quite tricky to absorb, so we often advise using these at night rather than using them during the day because you'll be sticky and slippery. Please be careful, though, that some ointments actually contain, contain paraffin, which is actually flammable, so take care if you like to sit next to the fire. So let's move on now to talk about itchy skin. Itchy skin in patients with renal disease known as uremic pruritus or more commonly chronic kidney disease, chronic kidney, uh, teeth in, chronic kidney disease associated pruritus, it's a bit of a mouthful. This is extremely common and in some cases can be significantly distressing for people with kidney disease. It can affect quality of life and if severe it can even stop you sleeping well and even lead to low mood. And in the past it has been difficult to treat. So what causes it? Actually, there's been a lot more research in recent years and we have a better understanding of what causes itching and renal disease. And it's probably a combination of these factors I've listed here. Renal failure leads to reduced clearance of some salts and toxins, which can then settle, settle in the skin and cause itching. Some patients also have specific damage to the nerve fibers, which then lead to the sensation of itch. Abnormal opioid balance in chronic kidney disease is really common. Opioids, you may have heard of uh, chemicals such as endorphins, which are the body's own opioid chemicals, which can lead to itching. We all know if you've had morphine, for example, in the past, that that also causes itching. So how can we manage this chronic kidney disease associated puritis? Well, I make no apologies for this slide, as some of the hints and tips on this slide may seem obvious, but not always to everyone. I sometimes see patients coming to clinic that are really troubled by their itching, but they're actually wearing a wool suit on a warm day and it's no surprise that their itching gets worse. So let's go through these hints and tips. We've talked about moisturising your skin in the previous slide and it's really important if you're itchy to keep your skin hydrated. I'd also advise wearing cool, lightweight cotton clothing and avoiding any fabrics that might be irritating to the skin and particularly wool. We advise to use lukewarm water when having your bath or shower as hot water will dilate those blood vessels in the skin and bring more of these toxins and inflammatory proteins, proteins to the surface and cause more itching. Now here's the difficult bit. We really do advise you to avoid scratching if you possibly can. Keep your fingernails short and don't buy a back scratcher because adding additional trauma to the skin adds a cycle of inflammation which actually makes itching worse in the longer term, but I do appreciate how difficult this is. I'd also suggest avoiding using soap if you can, as soap actually depletes the skin of its protective moisture layer and try a soap substitute instead. As I've previously mentioned, try not to rub your skin too much when washing, just pat the skin dry after you've had your shower or bath. And if your relatives will let you, try and shower or bath every other day rather than every day, as that will give your skin some time to recover. So just back to scratching. Why do we try not to scratch our skin if we have uremic puritis? This is why. The appearance of the skin can change significantly with repeated trauma due, due to scratching. And this is called nodular purigo, which can be quite unsightly and can act as a route of, inf of infection into the skin and can take uh, quite a while to heal. So this is why we avoid scratching if we possibly can. So what else can we do to help itching if it's persistent? Chronic kidney disease associated pruritus is actually a diagnosis of exclusion, which basically means this is what you've got if we've excluded every other possible diagnosis. And it's important to make sure there's no other treatable diagnosis, for example, eczema or even scabies or other itchy skin conditions. If you're on dialysis already, actually optimizing the dose of dialysis or dialyzing a bit more, if appropriate, can actually improve the symptom of itching. We've talked 
first about hydrating the skin with emollients and skin creams, but if simple emollients are not enough, there are many creams on the market these days that have active ingredients in them, and there's some examples here. Menthol and aqueous cream is really effective, and it's even better if you keep it in the fridge so it's nice and cooling. And another one that I prescribe quite often is E45 Itch Relief, which contains a local anaesthetic called Laura Macrogol, and Baunian Plus contains these active ingredients too. However, a word of caution, there's no good evidence in the literature to suggest which cream is better than the other. So I would advise trying lots of different ones and find which one suits you the best. Let's talk about antihistamines. CKD associated pruritus is not actually mediated by histamine. It's not actually an allergy, but and antihistamines have been tried, but unfortunately in clinical trials, they've not been shown to be effective. That said, they're generally speaking well tolerated with minimal side effects, and some antihistamines are quite sedating, so may be useful at nighttime to help you sleep. Additionally, if there's any skin trauma from scratching, the inflammatory process from scratching can be mediated by histamine, so they're certainly worth a go. And if you're still struggling with itching despite these measures, there are specific medical therapies available that are now recommended in current guidelines. The only drug that we can recommend by mouth is something called gabapentin or pregabalin. Both drugs are related to each other. These drugs are actually anti-epilepsy drugs and they stop the nerve firing in the brain if you've got an epileptic seizure. But the nerves in the periphery, in your arms and legs, for example, are made of the same stuff and you can stop these nerves firing with using gabapentin or pregabalin and they're very effective for itch. However, unfortunately, these drugs are renally cleared which means that they do last quite a while in the body and you have to start with a very low dose and infrequently, sometimes every other night. Please do ask your nephrologist if you'd be interested to try one of these. New research is coming out and there's actually newer agents on the horizon, even given intravenously on dialysis sessions that can help itching. So watch this space. So as I mentioned, CKD associated pruritus is a diagnosis of exclusion and it's not actually usually associated with a rash, but I've taken a few pictures here of various rashes which you may need to look out for and may be important to some of you. First one, this is vasculitis. Some of you may have been affected by vasculitis as a cause of your CKD. So vasculitis is an inflammatory condition which damages the blood vessels, which then leads to bleeding within the skin itself and causing this dark purple and dark red rash. It does not blanch under glass. And if you notice a rash like this, it's important to seek medical advice early as this rash can affect other organs of the body and need prompt treatment. These examples here are drug reactions. The skin is hot, red, itchy and inflamed. Looks really nasty, doesn't it? And typical appearances of this can occur with penicillin. That's a typical drug that can cause a drug reaction. It's treated usually with antihistamines and sometimes even with steroids. Unfortunately, once you've had a reaction like this to a drug like penicillin, the next time you take it, the reaction may even be worse. So it's important to not take the drug for the rest of your life. This is a similar kind of reaction. This is called urticaria. It's a similar allergic reaction and it's otherwise known as nettle rash or hives. Again, it's mediated by histamine and can be treated with antihistamines, but it's really itchy. The last one here that I'd like to talk about is shingles, which I'm sure some of you may have had, particularly if you've had a transplant. If you're on medication to suppress your immune system or you're feeling a bit run down, this can allow the body to reactivate the chickenpox virus that you may have had as a child. The rash appears along the distribution of a nerve, often looking like a stripe across the body, and unfortunately it can be really, really painful. The pain can persist for several months, if not be permanent, after the rash has resolved. So it's really important if you notice a rash like this to seek help early, as early treatment with antivirals and special types of painkillers, in fact, pregabalin or gabapentin, can actually lower the risk of permanent pain from this condition. So that shingles one to watch out for. So the next session, section of the talk is about skin cancer, which I know is a 
is a huge worry for some renal patients. It's important to know that skin cancer is actually the most common cancer after transplantation, often affecting up to 40% of renal transplant recipients. So it can be a big problem. And these are the risk factors for skin cancer that I'd like you to be aware of. The higher the dose of immunosuppression, these are the drugs for anti-rejection and to suppress your immune system. And the longer you've been on them increases your risk. Skin cancer is actually more common in white populations, and this is because white populations do not have so much melanin in the skin, which is the body's own protection from UV radiation. It goes without saying, and we all know this, that sun exposure increases your risk of skin cancer, and we'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. If you've had one skin cancer in the past, you are actually more likely to get another one in future, and this needs to be borne in mind if you're being worked up for transplantation. Men are more likely to get skin cancer than women, and actually they occur more often with advancing age. So why do transplant patients become more at risk of getting skin cancer? This schematic here just reminds us about UV radiation. There are two types of UV radiation, UVA and UVB. UVA radiation penetrates deeper into the skin, into the layers of the skin that provide the support structure for the skin. And actually over time, UVA can cause damage to these structures and cause aging. UVB actually doesn't penetrate that far into the skin, into the upper layers, and this is what causes sunburn. So UVA for aging, UVB for burn, just to help you to remember this in the future. Now here's the important bit. Both UVA and UVB can cause skin cancer as they damage the dividing skin cells and immune cells within the skin, which can then start to grow abnormally and form a cancer. So here's when immunosuppression comes in with transplant patients and those kidney patients that are on immunosuppression for other kidney diseases such as vasculitis. Your immune system is there to seek out and destroy abnormal cells. So intentionally lowering the immune system with these drugs can allow abnormal cells to grow. Some drugs are worse at this phenomenon than others. And I mention here particularly azathioprine has the highest risk among the common renal drugs. Now, please don't worry if you are taking this drug. It's a very good drug. It's been used by nephrologists for years, but please perhaps have a discussion with your nephrologist if you're worried about skin cancer in the future, as there are alternatives. Renal transplant patients are more easy to contract oncogenic or cancer forming viruses. And the one you may have heard of is HPV or human papillomavirus, and this cancer can, this virus can lead to the formation of skin cancers and actually other cancers like squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. So where does it happen? The common sites of skin cancer are on sun exposed areas, particularly the backs of the hands, the scalp, particularly in balding men, sorry, and also the tops of the ears, which is an area commonly missed when you're applying your sun, your sun cream. Let's go through now the different forms of skin cancer that you may need to watch out for. Firstly, this is a basal cell carcinoma or a BCC, otherwise known as a rodent ulcer. This is the most common skin cancer, okay, in the general population, but actually renal transplant patients are 16, one six times more likely to develop a BCC than the general population. They present initially as tiny pearly papules with a raised edge that may grow with time and then become inflamed and ulcerate in the middle like the bottom picture here. Although they can become locally invasive, they do not spread to the rest of the body, but they will not heal on their own and they do need to be removed. Next one to look out for is squamous cell carcinoma or SCC. And this is actually the most common form of skin cancer seen in renal transplant recipients. Now, in terms, oh. there we go, just get it to mute. There we are, sorry about that. So here's an interesting fact and quite a worrying fact. Squamous cell carcinomas are actually 250 times more likely to be present in a transplant patient than the general population. There's a big increase in risk if you're immunosuppressed. And this is why we worry about them. 
they present like these pictures here, red and scaly nodular areas within an area of sun damaged skin, and they may actually become painful. If they do become painful, this may signify that they've invaded the lower areas of the skin where the nerves are. So it's important that they're treated promptly as they may treat and they may spread to other parts of the body, particularly the lymph nodes. And then this is the worrying one. We've all heard of malignant melanoma, and this is the nastiest form of skin cancer. The risk is higher in men compared to women and with increasing age, but interestingly, they're more common in black populations, which can make them harder to spot. Notice in the pictures on the right of this slide about the irregular outline of a malignant melanoma, and often areas of pigment within the melanoma look different to the next area, so a variation in color. Those are the things to look out for. Now, unfortunately, malignant melanoma can spread to the rest of the body, and it often does so quite early, so these need to be spotted and removed as soon as possible. You may end up needing surgery and potentially other therapies like chemotherapy to treat malignant melanoma, but treatment these days is so good that the treatment can often be curative. So what can we do to help prevent skin cancer, to look for it early and to get it treated? Firstly, be aware of it like during our discussion today and protect yourself from the sun as much as you can. And we'll come on to that in more detail in the next slide. At the end of the talk, I've got a link there to a video which shows you how to examine your skin properly to make sure these lesions are picked up early. Secondly, if you're at higher risk of skin cancer for any reason, your nephrologist may tailor your immunosuppression accordingly to lower your risk. And if you have any concerns, please do discuss this at your next clinic appointment. There are also things a dermatologist can do called chemoprotection. These are drugs that can be prescribed to patients that have had a skin cancer in order to lower their risk of having another one in future. And the drugs, the examples include acetretin and nicotinamide. Unfortunately, these drugs are not always well tolerated as they do cause very dry skin in some and they're not suitable for use in women of childbearing age. Photodynamic therapy is an interesting one. The patient is given a drug that is actually light sensitive and it travels to the skin and is activated under the presence of UV light to, in order to carry out the treatment. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, is post-transplant surveillance. In some areas in the country, this is available on the NHS and renal transplant patients and others at risk are seen by a dermatologist formally on an annual basis for skin surveillance. But unfortunately, in the current NHS financial climate, this service is not um, available, unfortunately, in lots of areas, and it's certainly not available in Portsmouth at present. So that's why it's important to look out for any changes in your own skin. This is what we're trying to avoid. This is sunburn. And if anyone comes to my clinic looking like this, I'm afraid they will get a bit of a talking to, but in a nice way. Please try and avoid your shoulders looking like that. So how to look after yourself in the sun. There are three things that you can do to protect yourself from the sun. Firstly, just avoid it altogether, particularly during the hottest hours in the middle of the day. And then always use a sun cream. I use sun cream every day going out. We have to look for one with a high SPF or sun protection factor, and we recommend SPF 50. SPF 30 is okay to use, it's not quite as thick as SPF 50, so it's easier to rub in and easier to use, but just be aware that SPF 50 is significantly better. Now, all sun creams have to be UVB protective as they protect against sunburn, but not all sun creams are also UVA protective. You need to look out for this little logo on the bottle to make sure they're also protective against UVA because they don't have to be. And it's a star rating, one to five, and try and pick one that's a five star rating. And then it will protect you from skin cancer as well as aging. We recommend that skin cream is actually applied at least 20 minutes before you go out in the sun because it takes that long to work. And then try to reapply it every couple of hours and particularly after swimming. If you can, try and find a lip balm that contains SPF as the lips are often a site of some skin cancers. And also to protect your eyes is a good idea 
as renal patients are often more at risk of cataract and the more sun exposure you have, the higher the risk of getting a cataract later on in life. So treat yourself to a nice pair of sunglasses. Last thing is protect yourself from the sun just using clothing and thinking about a hat is an obvious one. But you can actually buy specific sun protective clothing and wearing a rash vest while you're swimming is a good idea. So all of these three mechanisms can put lower the risk of sun damaged skin and they have been shown to reduce the risk of squamous cell carcinoma in renal transplant patients. As I alluded to at the beginning, the skin is a major manufacturing site of vitamin D within the body. So patients that protect themselves from the sun really well, and particularly those patients with darker skin and those who wear concealing clothing for cultural reasons can actually become vitamin D deficient. Vitamin D is really easy to supplement. You can buy supplements like this from any supermarket, but please do check with your nephrologist first as some patients may have high calcium levels or perhaps any other reasons where vitamin D therapy might not be appropriate. So do check. I do want to have one quick um, conversation about sunbeds. Okay, we all feel a bit better and may look a bit better with having a bit of a tan, but unfortunately, Having a tan does not protect you from sunburn and it does not protect you from getting skin cancer. In fact, it only provides very minimal protection from the sun. On the plus side, however, sunbeds have been shown to improve pain relief and also mood. But actually, the effect that they give you is actually biochemically addictive. I think there are other ways, uh, other methods of improving your mood and relaxing because Actually, using a sunbed increases your risk of getting a melanoma by an absolutely staggering amount. And the risk is even higher if you start using sunbeds at a young age. And in fact, sunbeds are banned in most countries in children, and they're completely banned in Australia, where obviously there's more sun. So I have to conclude when we talk about sunbeds is that I'd advise you to think of other ways to relax. And just to finish the talk, lots of skin lesions crop up from time to time and you may worry about them that they may be a skin cancer. So I've just picked a few examples here of things that you may look out for but aren't actually a skin cancer. This here is an example of actinic keratosis, which basically means sun damaged skin. It's really common, particularly on the scalp and can be quite irritating for some. However, it is not cancerous and can be easily treated by the GP with creams such as Effidix and Aldara. These creams do help significantly, but the rash can look worse before it gets better and can become quite sore, but it is treatable. This one here is called Bowen's disease, which is otherwise known as squamous cell carcinoma in situ, so SCC in situ. This means that it's actually a precancerous condition and if left for months to years, it can actually turn into an SCC. So it's important to recognize these. And interestingly, they often occur in the lower leg in women. This one here is called a seborrheic keratosis, bit of a mouthful, otherwise known as a seborrheic wart. They can occur on their own, or sometimes they can occur in, occur in quite large numbers, particularly over the skin at the back. Although perhaps a little bit unsightly, they are completely harmless and require no specific treatment, but it's actually sometimes quite tricky to tell the difference between a seborrheic keratosis and a malignant melanoma. So if there's any doubt, please seek help. And the last one here, we've all had these. These are viral warts. They occur really quite commonly in patients who are on immunosuppression and take absolutely ages to resolve, but they usually do so on their own, but it can take a year or more. To speed up resolution, there are many medications that you can paint on or even have cryotherapy, which means freezing them off if they become troublesome. So we've talked about quite a lot in the last 20 minutes or so. Patients with chronic kidney disease and those on dialysis do have a lot of issues with their skin at times, but there's lots you can do to improve the appearance and feel of your skin at home. Please do check with your nephrologist at your clinic appointment if you're having itchy skin and having trouble with it, as lots more can be done these days to try and alleviate the symptoms. And I hope I've got the message across about staying out of the sun to protect yourself from a risk of skin cancer, particularly if you've had a transplant or on immunosuppression for other reasons. 
I'll just add a quick disclaimer at the end is that I'm not a dermatologist, I'm a nephrologist, but I do have an interest in skin issues. Please obviously see your GP or talk to your renal team if you have any concerns about your skin. And I'll take this opportunity to thank you for the invitation to talk to you this evening and thank you for your attention. I hope you found the session useful. And as I mentioned, I've included a couple of links here for more information about skin cancer if you find that useful. And also there's a video there on how to perform a proper skin self-examination. Thank you very much and I'm happy to take some questions. Jackie, thank you very much for that. Really informative. And yeah, we've got loads and loads of questions. So okay. Let's get the chat back box up and um, we'll have a look at what we've got. Um, bear with me because it disappeared off my screen. So here we go. Um, so the first question from a lady, um, husband has awkward itchy skin, started on arms and legs, tried various over-the-counter products. What else can be considered? Excellent question. I get asked this and, uh, quite a lot. Unfortunately, I'm not wishing to plug my own work, but I've recently done a clinical trial into various skin creams and found that there's no difference between a couple of them that we tried. Um, if the simple emollients are not working well enough, then try one with active ingredients. Um, if you go to any chemist or supermarket over the, um, where they've got a, a pharmacy in the supermarket, there'll be plenty of creams. The ones I recommend to my own patients are Balneum Plus, or E45 itch. They contain the same ingredients of a local anesthetic and I find that to be most effective. If not, try the menthol one. Um, but if you're struggling with creams to make any difference, then please seek advice from the nephrologist to try some tablet treatment instead. Good luck. Thank you. Right, next question. I joined a few minutes past five, so I might have missed this, but how do the different stages of CKD affect itchy skin? Thank you. A very good question, actually. It was often thought that the more advanced stages of chronic kidney disease, so remember it's stage one to five, one is where you've got normal GFR, glomerular filtration rate, and five is where perhaps approaching the need to consider renal replacement therapy. It used to be thought that the more advanced your kidney disease is, the more likely you're to get itching, but actually that's not the case. Itching is still quite common, even in stages two to three, so it mustn't be dismissed as just one of those things. It might be due to your kidney disease and manage it as we've discussed, but it's really common in early stages, unfortunately. So we carry on with the subject of itchy skin. And this question is, why does my itchy scalp come and go? That's a good question. And I have to say, it's a difficult one for me to answer because when you think about a scalp, it, it could possibly be an allergic reaction to shampoo or conditioner or something else that you're using on the hair. That's something to think about. Um, and just to make doubly sure there's no sort of, um, how should I phrase this, um, lice infestation or anything like that to make sure there's no underlying cause of the itch. It's unusual for CKD associated itch just to be on the scalp. I just wonder if this, um, whoever answered the question has itch everywhere else or whether it's just the scalp. It's worth having a look. Brilliant, thank you. So we're going from head to hands now. I have... Um cuticle damage and my fingernails are receding. Is this to do with CKD? Possibly, possibly. Um, nails receding is quite common if you've got psoriasis. That might be something that's worth looking at. But if people's fingernails are actually receding, I want to have a good look at vitamin deficiencies and various minerals. I'm quite, be quite keen to look at things like iron deficiency and zinc deficiency if people are having problems with their nails but not specifically related to CKD, I don't think. Next question. I recently had a transplant and used to have normal dry skin. Since my transplant, I found that my face has become greasy, developing pimples around the forehead. Is there any tips to manage greasy um, skin and get rid of the pimples? Firstly, congratulations on your transplant. I hope everything else is going okay. Um, I'd be willing to bet that this might be related to post-transplant immunosuppression, particularly steroids. Um, they're well known to affect skin and cause skin infections like this. It sounds like it might be folliculitis where you're talking about greasiness and pimples, which is actually a skin infection. Hopefully, as time moves on, your steroid dose will be reduced. But in the meantime, you can try an antibiotic wash. You can even perhaps ask the transplant nurses to give you a bottle of the 
the wash they give to patients before they go down to theatre, which is quite effective for this, something called octenosan, which has an antibiotic ingredient in it, which might help clear this up. But if necessary, tablet antibiotics can be used. So we continue with um, itchy skin. I have awkward itchiness on my legs and the skin was peeling off. A private, private dermatologist prescribed potassium penangulate, I think it is. Permanganate, the purple stuff. Yeah. yeah, which cleared it up, but I still get itchy legs. Oh gosh, that sounds really nasty. Yeah, dermatologists can prescribe potassium permanganate sort of as a soak, I think, to really help get moisture back into the skin. It's not something we use as nephrologists, the, the dermatologists, that's more on their radar. But if you're still getting itching, um, make sure the legs are really, really moisturized and make sure there's no other reason for it to be so severe as this. Gosh, it sounds really sore. So what causes itchy skin with CKD patients? And is there any foods that can reduce the itchiness? Excellent question. If we turn the clock back 10, 20 years ago, it was thought that CKD associated itching was due to high phosphate levels and also parathyroid issues, which is what we now call renal bone disease or mineral bone disorder. Um, actually, the more newer um, trials coming out and um, investigations, and it's not specifically due to phosphate, but it's often something that we do think of if someone comes with itchy skin just to try and optimize dialysis or optimize dietary control of phosphate to see if that will help. Because I think it's at least partially to blame if it's not the total cause of CKD associated itching. Fantastic. Right. We talked about sun cream earlier. So how long does SPF 50 sun cream last and be effective? Some of them are marketed for up to eight hours. I struggle to believe that because in particularly in hot environments, you will sweat some of it off. So the, the bottom line is I would suggest reapplying it every two to three hours, which uh, we have to sort of think about. It does become quite expensive. Sun cream is not the, most, the cheapest skin cream you can buy, but it's really worth the investment and applying it before you go out, at least 20, 30 minutes before you go out in the sun. And then again, every two to three hours or so. And what about the shelf life of the sun cream as well? I did look at this recently, actually, because there, there was a, a tale um, that I've seen in many a magazine that it only lasts a year. They often have a little badge on the back with a little um, open uh, diagram of a bottle with the figure 12 on it for 12 months. And you're sort of meant to buy new sun cream every year for your holiday for next year. But actually, the thing uh, uh, the article I've read recently says that's not the case. And it does actually last longer than it is. It's probably a marketing thing to make you buy more the following year. But realistically, if you've had a bottle open for two or three years or more, I'd buy a new one. So we carry on with that theme of skin cancer. Um, is the risk affected in dark skin tones as well as light skin? That's an interesting one, actually. The the. The basal cell carcinomas and the squamous cell carcinomas are more common in white populations, but the melanoma are actually more common in darker skinned uh, patients. Um, with the mixed skin tones, I guess that's your risk factors will be in the middle and the bottom line is protect yourself from the sun, no matter what your ethnicity or skin tone is. But then um, lighter skin tones, for example, uh, people with sort of lighter blonder hair and ginger hair, for example, do have certainly a higher risk of skin cancer, unfortunately. And someone's just um, put a question here, which is quite interesting. Um, mm. Someone told me in the week that you can risk skin cancer if you sit in the front of a window at work or in the car. Is this true? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, even sun coming through a window, it won't block out all of the UV radiation. So, and it's perfectly possible to get sunburn when you're driving a car on a hot day uh, with yourself next to the window. So I would advise any sun exposed areas, backs of hands, forearms, face, sun cream every day, if I were you. The questions keep coming in. You're not out of the woods no, yet. No, that's fine, I'm okay. So, does PKD cause sunspots, age spots, it seems to have a lot of them as I'm getting older and didn't have them before. 
Good question. I'm not sure 100% know the answer to that. Uh, sunspots and age spots obviously do increase with increasing age, but with PKD uh, specifically, polycystic kidney disease, I'm sure you're aware, is a, can be associated with collagen disorders. And collagen is what sort of knits you all together. It forms the structure of the skin and other organs. And unfortunately, PKD patients are more at risk of um, others issues like hernias and things like that with sort of things getting, how should I phrase this, looser, if that's a, not an unpolite way to describe it. And the skin will be no different. But sunspots uh, and age spots do happen with increasing age, certainly. Another question, my son, uh, my skin is very thin, slightest knot gets bruised, yeah. uh, even tears. Is this due to steroids or the change of my meds? Yes, it is. And uh, I think this is a, quite a common thing. I didn't put it in my talk, but thin skin, friable skin that bruises easily and bleeds easily is a real uh, a common problem in CKD patients, unfortunately. And steroids make it a lot worse because you get quite a lot of skin thinning if you're taking steroids. Um, I guess it's a bit difficult to comment whether or not your steroids can be reduced, but actually certainly something that you could ask. Brilliant. I have small patches um, on my legs, which started as a rage itchy lump. Um, this is developed into something that looks like shingles in small areas, mm. um, around about half an inch across. They have blisters and heal over. Five doctors do not know what they are. Um, could they be um, to do with my PKD? Gosh, that sounds like an interesting one. PKD, probably not. I wonder if those five doctors were all nephrologists or have you actually seen a dermatologist? Because it sounds like a time for a dermatologist to see it, definitely. Um, shingles can be itchy. Usually uh, it causes significant pain or burning sensation, tingling sensation, but itching is less common. And usually you'll have a, a sort of stripe of shingles and it's there for a couple of weeks, three, four weeks maybe, and then it all goes away. But if it's coming up in sort of different areas, that's slightly odd. So definitely time to see a dermatologist. Good luck. Another question. I'm on stage five CKD patient. I have recently started getting very dry, itchy patches on my face. I use moisturizer and E45. Is there something else I can use? Dry scaly patches on the face are perhaps less common. Um, the dry skin that I have uh, described is more usually seen on the back, on the arms, on the legs. So specific discrete patches on the face, I would recommend uh, having a dermatologist or at least your GP to have a look at and just to make sure the diagnosis is correct, because it may be patches of psoriasis, for example, that will need a different uh, formulation of skin cream to try and clear it up. Now, slightly away from kidney disease, I have warfarin, or I take warfarin. Um, does this affect my skin? Good question. Not specifically, but it will potentially make you bleed more if you knock your skin or if you cut your skin shaving or anything like that. But warfarin in itself, to my knowledge at least, doesn't cause skin thinning on its own. Are the products that you use on your skin absorbed and need to be processed by the kidneys? Oh, good. Thank you for asking that. That's a really, really good question, actually. And the answer is yes. The skin is used to absorb medication and you actually absorb water through your skin very, very quickly. A particular example I'll give here is anti-inflammatory creams, things like I believe, Emil Gel, Fembid, that contain anti-inflammatory drugs, which I'm sure most of you will be aware of to try and avoid if you've got chronic kidney disease. These drugs are absorbed through the skin and they're very cleverly marketed. When you see the adverts for these things, someone might have a sore elbow and it's red and it's pulsing. And then you put the cream on and it goes nice and blue and butterflies fly off or something to relieve the pain. It's absolute nonsense. There is no direct channel from the outside world into that sore elbow it must go through the skin and be absorbed into the blood vessels to be effective so you can put your cream on here and that elbow will get better so be really careful with those particular things but most things that you put on your skin will be absorbed definitely right we're getting to the end of the questions now i have dry flaky skin not itchy what is the best cream to use 
excellent question. We don't know. Well, lots of trials have been done comparing one, one cream to another, but we do not know which is best as yet. So my main recommendation is try as many different ones as you can and find out which one works for bet works for the best for you. If it's itchy and flaky, then the more the thicker ones with less water content, the more ointment type applications can really, really help. And um, things like Vaseline, uh, paraffin containing ointments are really helpful for dry, flaky skin. But as I mentioned in the presentation, they're an absolute devil to absorb into your skin and it takes ages, but they really do help. I myself have contact dermatitis. Anyone that I actually work with knows this. I'm allergic to latex. And if by accident I wear a latex glove, my skin will flake off everywhere. And Vaseline at night for a few days sorts that right out. So the go for the more ointment um, thickness of the skin emollient and see if that will help. A um, few more questions just come in now. Is the shingles vaccine safe for kidney patients? Excellent question. Um, if you are on immunosuppression, so perhaps after a transplant or on drugs to suppress your immune system for vasculitis, then most shingles vaccines are actually live vaccines and live vaccines must be avoided um, if you're on immunosuppression. I have heard that there's a new vaccine coming out, which isn't live, otherwise known as attenuated, which is like the other vaccines that we give routinely, like flu or COVID, et cetera. But the shingles vaccine most usually is a live vaccine, which must be avoided. If you have CKD and are not immunosuppressed, it's fine to have. And in fact, you should have it to try and prevent shingles in the future. Now, in your presentation, you spoke about soap not being good. Um, someone's asked about soap substitutions. OK, good question. Um, the one I um, advise to patients, Baunium, have a soap substitute and also Oilatum. You can buy that in any chemist or supermarket, which acts as a soap substitute. I think Dermol have one as well. But a quick pop into Boots or other chemists are available and um, they'll be able to advise you on soap substitutes but they're much more hydrating to the skin and they don't deplete the natural moisture layer that you'll be lacking in any way. Are there any face creams or body moisturizers that transplant patients should avoid? Oh good question. No don't think so. Don't yeah. use anything you like nothing springs to mind. The only things um creams that I've mentioned that I would advise all renal patients to avoid is the ones that contain anti-inflammatories but I don't think you usually put those on your face a good question someone said thank you very much very informative that's all they've put oh, that's nice. and I think that just sums it up really thank you very much um I think we've covered nearly every single question there that you didn't cover in your presentation um I don't know if um Tess from CKP has got any Questions just before we close it, Tess. No, that was uh, riveting, and thank you so much, Jackie. You uh, you were unfazed by any of those questions, and um, uh, covered such a range of information that I'm trying to absorb it all in myself, uh, having tried a number of creams to cope with dry skin after transplant. So mm. very very helpful. Yeah. It is quite a challenge. I do appreciate how tricky it is to look after your skin. And it's not something that all of us nephrologists have A, an interest in or B, time to ask about, uh, which is a real shame. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm a, um, I really try hard to ask my patients if there is a problem or anything else I can help with. And sometimes you have to push a little bit to um because renal patients are so stoic, they look after themselves brilliantly well and they don't like to ask questions. But re I'd really try to prompt them and see what else we can do to help. I was also pleased that you mentioned phosphate because we still have that historic uh, patient view that, uh, you know, somebody says, oh, I've got dry, itchy skin, your phosphate's too high. And that leads to a conversation about diet and so on. So I think we need to get that message across much more strongly that it is of a, uh, a, a range of factors, not just... Uh, no, exactly. Jump to that old conclusion. Yeah, it's an inflammatory condition. It's mainly yeah. due to inflammation. Unfortunately, anti-inflammatories don't fix it, but we'll find something that helps eventually. And about the PKD and um, potentially more prone to to uh, to some sort of skin conditions or cancerous conditions, it is a collective. As you said, there is a collagen collective tissue problem, but 
I haven't seen any case reports um, indicating it's highly associated, but I will be on the lookout now that mm. somebody's raised that question. That's very interesting. Mm. Lots and lots of positive comments um, coming in now. And if you did come in late and thought you might have missed the first 10 minutes or anything, we have got this recorded. We're going to put it on our website in the morning from around about 10 o'clock. Um, so you will be able to watch it again. So spread the word if you've um, got some colleagues or friends or anything that would like to watch it. Um, it will be on our website. So kidney.org.uk. So I think that's about it. Thank you ever so much for joining us. Um, we've had a record amount of viewers um, for our webinar today. We'll be doing another one in a couple of months time. Thank you very much.